Okay, so last last week we started talking about the conquest. No, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago we started talking about the conquest. Um, and we kind of are moving a little bit ahead and backwards. The last two weeks ago, this week, and then probably again next week, looking at the wilderness travel and the um, conquest itself. So let's see if we can make sense of some of this stuff and answer the question of did it actually happen? So when we get past the Exodus with those uh, those potential references to the Israelites that we looked at before, um, the next question obviously being, so where did they go after that? I mean, like, we know where the Bible says where they went, but I mean, like, how come nobody mentions them afterwards? What happened? So the earliest reference, um, besides our possible references in 1479 in Egypt, is in about 1380. Um, they mention a people called the Shasu of the land of Yahweh. Now, there's really no place that we can identify with this. So it's kind of caused a little bit of discussion, but it seems like um, the most realistic um, translation of this is nomads of the land of Yahweh. So this is very significant because, first off, these, these people, whoever they are, they're nomads. So these are people who were either didn't have a home or were kind of um, Arab-like peoples or... Um, were like um, shepherd kind of people, so this is kind of important because this Israel would definitely fall into this category. Um, and then there's the reference to Yahweh, the only people group that we have historical record of, um, you know, at this point, claiming to follow Yahweh would be Israel. So there's something else significant, um, and there is no area that we can directly relate to this. So it seems like. It seems like this might be a veiled reference to Israel. Um, it's after our dating of the Exodus. Our Exodus, we, we dated in 1479. This is after that. Um, it is the earliest reference to Yahweh outside of the Bible because, remember, so. Um, there's no discernible location or people that we can connect this to apart from Israel, um, other than if we just kind of assume. Um, so who were these nomads in the area after our day of the Exodus who worshipped Yahweh? Well, only one people that we've ever found proof of claim that, and that's Israel. So unless we have some other evidence, it, the, the most likely is this might be a reference to Israel. So then there's a, a group of letters called the Amarna Letters. These are some correspondence between the rulers of Canaan and the Egyptian pharaohs. They go back and forth. Uh, they talk about a lot of different things, but some of the things that they talk about – quite a lot, is they were having some problems with invaders. Um, so it, it, people go back and forth about were these Israelites or were they not. Um, it it definitely fits into our time frame, and we know that there were other other people who were migrating in besides Israel who were in there at the same time, so it seems like it might have been at least some of these invaders were Israel. Then... Um, we have another reference to Israel uh, from the 1200s uh, called the um, Merneptus Delay. I'm sorry, that first reference is called the Soleb Inscription, if you wanted to look it up for yourself. And the last one here, Israel is laid waste and his seed is not, is called the Merneptus Delay. Um, it dates to around 1200. Um, it, this doesn't necessarily mean that, that they went to battle with Israel. I know it sounds like you know they had this great victory over Israel, but this is kind of just the way that they talked. It's very possible that um, it, Egypt was going through Canaan, conquering like some areas, and Israel saw them and just kind of avoided them. And then the Pharaoh would have claimed, of course, to make himself out to be the greatest guy in the world. Uh, hey, his seed is not. Yeah, I, I cowered them into submission. So I mean, this doesn't necessarily mean that there actually even was a battle. Um, but either way, so we know that Israel was a people realized as Israel, who was in Canaan by the 1200s. Um, so you, you take all these together, and it looks like um, we've got some proof for the for the Exodus dates and all that stuff, and and for Israel and all that. So let's let's kind of look at some more stuff here. Next, we get to the issue of the law. Now, 
the law is very interesting because we can actually date when the law was written by the content itself. Um, in his book on the reliability of the, um, of the Old Testament, Kenneth Kitchen uh, shows the contrast between the different periods of history when laws were written. And the only period of history that this law relates to is a period from 1400 to 1200. So we know that the law was written after 1400, before 1200. So this also helps us date Israel. Um, some might say, well, how do we know that they didn't just copy an older uh, form? Well, first off, why would they have dated to that time is the first issue. Second off, the people wouldn't have um, gotten the message from that. And then third off, they wouldn't have had access to the, to the information to have done that. So it's something that it would have had to have happened at that time. Um, so you can see here the contrast between between the between the time frames here. It matches up perfectly. Title, historical prologue, stipulations, uh, reading, witnesses, blessings, curses. So you know there, there's definitely that. Now, if you remember, uh, I mentioned um, about how Egypt was fighting. Egypt in the south was fighting a, a kingdom called Mitanni in the north. Remember that. Well, um, shortly after we dated the Exodus, so some things happened. They ended up calling a truce, and another power called the uh, the Hittites kind of moves in and starts dominating there. They end up really ruling that that Turkey area. They never get down as far as Israel, but they do, you know, rule that area. So their influence would have it, it makes very much so sense why the Israel's law code relates to their. Uh, law code they, they, right around the same time. So that explains where the influence comes in at. Um, okay, so the Exodus in 1479 with Moses, entrance to Canaan in 1439 by Joshua. It gives us a good little, a good little, little, little uh, uh, chronology there, but we have a little bit of an issue. See, we're about 40 years too early. See, it, it, we're about 40 years off. The, it, it, their law was written after 1400, not before 1400. And so this is the biggest hurdle to overcome with um, with my dating that I've shown you guys. Now, there is a way around it, and I will show it to you guys. But remember, if all this stuff doesn't add up, something's wrong. Either my dating's wrong, or you know we, we've dated the things that we found wrong, or something needs to change. So let's look at this, and I'll let you guys come to your own, own conclusion. Deuteronomy 31.24 says this. It says, when Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book to the very end. There's the problem. We know that Moses was dead by 1439 if my dating is correct, which means it was too early. It was too early for it to for it to fit. So someone might say, well, how do we know that Moses wasn't the one who came up with this um this format and the Hittites copied him. Well, that, that that's very unlikely. Um, it's very unlikely for a number of reasons, but the most obvious reasons is because Hittite isn't and the Hittites were an empire, and Israel was just another group of, of tribal people in Canaan, um, really not big enough to warrant them copying their law formulation. It just, you know, it just they didn't have anything to do with each other. So, but there is still a way around it. Joshua twenty four twenty six says this. Um, and Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Now, there is the possibility that Moses wrote the original law. okay? And then when Joshua wrote in the law, that he reformatted it to mirror the, the, the popular format of the time, rather than keeping it in the older model that Moses wrote it in. That's possible. Um, there is one little piece of information that might might encourage this, but it's very vague. This is this is kind of going out on a limb, so don't don't take this as gospel fact. This this is definitely something that has to be considered. Joshua twenty three one says this: a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years. So there's there's a there's a substantial amount of time. Is it possible that it was 
40 years later that Joshua wrote this? Yes, it is possible. It's a little grand, maybe a little unlikely, but it is possible. That would mean that when Joshua was first referenced in the books of the law, when he helps uh, Moses fight the, I believe it's the Arameans, uh, by holding up, you know, the, they're holding up their arms and Joshua's fighting the enemies and all that. Um, I believe it's in Exodus, if I remember correctly. That would mean that Joshua would have had to be around 20 at the time. Because if you add 40 years to that, he would be 60. And that would be when Moses died. So Joshua would have began, would have began when he was 60. And we need at least 40 more years. That would make him at 100. And the book of Joshua says that he died, I believe, at 110. So that is possible. It, it is possible that in his twilight years, he reformatted the law to fit um, the popular format of the time. That's possible. I'll let you come to your own conclusion on that. That is the biggest hurdle that you have to face with my timing, with my with my time frame. So, um, so that's the theory. Moses wrote it and Joshua reorganized it. Possible. Um, another idea is that there was a later e editor after Joshua and Moses were already dead that they took the law and they said, you know what? Let's make this a little more relevant. Let's let's kind of just move the formula around. It's possible again too, but it's questionable how much freedom they felt that they had in order to make those edits. So that's definitely something that you have to come up with. Now, we do know that there was minor editing. For instance, when it says Ur of the Chaldees, we already looked at this. This was hundreds of years after Moses and Joshua. So it, it's possible. It is possible. But either way, it does fit that time. So even though we're not exactly precise on everything, it, the time frame does does definitely fit. So let's look at some issues with the conquest itself. The first issue is that we don't know how long it took. It's never specified in the book of Joshua how long this took. Um, to add to the confusion, there's a, if you go to the third point there, there's a huge overlap with Joshua and Judges, the two books. There's a huge overlap there. So we have that problem. Um, if you look in Ju Judges chapter 1, Judges chapter 1, 8 through 10, it says this. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem, captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. And afterward the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country in the Negev, which is south of Jerusalem, and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was former, formerly Kiriath Arba, and they defeated Shishai and Heman and Telmai. Now, then you go to Joshua chapter 12, verse 10, and it says this. Um, it's, uh, and these are in verse 7, and these are the kings of the land whom Joshua and the people of Israel defeated on the west side of the Jordan. Then you go down to verse 10, it says, the king of Jerusalem. So it seems like they're, this is detailing the same event. If not, then they, this happened multiple times that they conquered it. But then later in Judges, it's going to tell you that they didn't conquer Jerusalem completely. So there's that. And then there's the issue that Jerusalem never well, it wasn't completely burned. They started a fire. The, the people in Jerusalem were able to calm it down. And Jerusalem wasn't fully conquered until King David came and conquered it much later, down by 1000 uh, BC. So you, you've got kind of that going on there. And then there's another issue that in older writings, they have a weird way of saying stuff and, and talking about stuff. So when they say about conquering and subduing and pacifying an area, that doesn't mean that they inhabited the area. That doesn't mean that they had control. It's just that there was a military force that they, um, they – that military force met their match, and they were able to hold their ground. ground. That's, that's really all that that means. Um, so when it says conquered, don't read too much into that. Think more of subdued or pacified. Uh, Joshua 12.10, and the, we can uh, compare this to, to many different um, historical records of the time where, where this is just how people write. Um, you shouldn't really read too much into it. Joshua 12.10 where it says, um, well, I actually, mm, yeah, I'll go ahead and read this because I just mentioned it, so why not? So in 12.10 it says the king of Jerusalem, they, they defeated him. But then in Judges 1.8 it says that that I already read to you about how they fought him, so there's that overlap there. But then you get Judges 1, verse 21, and it says, 
But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with this people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. So there it kind of implies that Israel was able to live in the city, but then later it seems like they didn't live in the city. So it seems like there was a, a lot of sway. Remember two weeks ago I showed you the map and I said don't think of these as defined definite lines. Think of them as kind of moving because that's kind of what happened in Canaan. Canaan was constantly shifting. Um, and then in um, 2 Samuel 5.69... Which is the other part I was I was talking about. It says, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will, will uh, ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, and David said on that day, Whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him give up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore, it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the millow inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. So there's that. Um, as far as so how big was the conquest? Well, this is a very tricky thing. Israel was able to establish a, 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 a stronghold. We know that. They were able to, to get their feet in. But beyond that, it's a lot of speculation. Um, because there was so much moving ground at this time, we really can't date too much. Um, and then Jericho, which would have been an enormous help in, in helping us date stuff. Once again, I already mentioned this two weeks ago about how, how ruined the site is. So we're left with a lot of problems and not a whole lot of answers. But what we do know is that they were gaining ground at first and then after some amount of time that they stopped because they started acting like the Canaanites. So there's the picture. Um, it says that um, that some places were burned but not completely. An example of this would be Hazor. Um, this was a city that was burned. We, we, I showed you that. There is, a, there is a burning that happened in the 1400s. But once again, it wasn't burned completely. And a couple of the cities that that was mentioned. Jericho is the only city that was completely destroyed, and God actually tells them this. He says, Jericho alone com destroy completely, and he goes on and on talking about how they need to inhabit the places. So, you know, God clearly said, do not burn everything. He clearly said that they were going to live in the places that the Canaanites used to live in. So, there's all that. Um, there wasn't a mass destruction either way. We know that the Canaanites were not wiped out. The Bible says that. We, we found DNA evidence of that. Okay, absolutely. So we don't really know. So there's just a lot of questions there. Um, we do know that at the time of Judge, the book of Judges, most of the skirmishes are in eastern Canaan. I mentioned this two weeks ago. And most of Philistines, uh, I mean, sorry, the Egyptians' uh, skirmishes were in western Canaan. So it seems like they kind of just kept space from each other. Um, also, there, there's another very important aspect to dating this. Um, which I don't want you to overlook. Okay, the Philistines were not did not move into the Canaan into the Canaan area until the 1200s. Okay, now there might have been a smaller Philistine amount, absolutely, but the big force of the Philistines did not move in until the 1200s. And so we've looked, we've talked about the Philistines before. I'll talk about them again here in a little bit. Moral of the story being 1200. Okay, well. Isn't it a quinky dink that you don't find Israel having any issues with the Philistines until halfway through the book of Judges? Which goes to reason that that's because they weren't there to cause a problem. That seems to be what the issue is. Now, if that's true, and I'm not just making this up and like overlooking something, which I don't think I am. I've read the account a hundred times. Um, that would seem to push for our, our dating that puts the Exodus in the 1400s rather than the 1200s. So this, this is kind of something that you need to think about, whichever way you decide to go with the dating. So real quick, and we'll end with this, who were the Philistines? We've talked about this before. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands. It's possibly a, bank, a blanket term used in the Bible for sea peoples that lived in that area. So there's that. Then also, it's possibly a small amount that lived there before the actual Philistines lived there um, in 1200. So like maybe like an early settlement that came before the major force. Um, 
The Philistines have no records, so they're only recorded by their enemies, so obviously we don't know too much about them. And um, it's also possibly an early mention. So like, let's say, for instance, the people that lived there before who weren't actually ethnically Philistines might have still been Philistines, even though they weren't related by blood. So there's that. But it's a, possibly an early mention uh, to foreshadow the Philistines. So like, for instance, an example of this would be um, the people who lived in New Mexico before New Mexico was a state. Well, we might call them New Mexicans, looking forward to the fact that this would soon, this would eventually be New Mexico, but that doesn't mean that they were actually New Mexicans in the legal sense. Um, or they were giving the name of the area to pre-civilization, I already mentioned that, um, or it was updated, or it was edited, etc., etc., etc. So... Long story short here, the, 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 main, the main message here is that the appearance of the Philistines halfway through the book of Judges seems to encourage an earlier date, and um, there's a lot of questions about the conquest, and the date, the law is dated to somewhere after 1400 and somewhere before 1200. That's the main points of tonight. Any questions before we close this out? Okay, so the, the you said that it, we're about 40 years off with your date. Right? Yes. Do, does 40 years really matter? With something like this, yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. And then also, um, you said they're dating, it could be, the uh, X's could either be 1,200 or 1,400. Um, when is the dating of the, uh, of the law? Of the law? Isn't that what the 40 years off is, right? Right. After 1400, before 1200. So, so technically speaking, it, the X's could have happened in the 1200s, and it, the law would fit perfectly fine in there. Was that answer your question? Yeah. Because it looks like you still had something. No, that my okay. Um, the traditional dating of 1445 would work, however, too, because, um, you know, 40 years later, that could mean Moses. Could I hypothetically, you know, <laughs> yeah. or at least given Joshua the, the skeleton of it. Right. So, uh, any other questions? Nope? We're good? Okay. You know, it would really help if we could just find Moses' bones, and we could just take them. <laughs> yeah, well, well, God buried him somewhere. We don't know.